Good morning. I am ICJA Executive Director Del Reese Adams and a founding member of the Government Alliance for Safe Communities, which you'll hear us referring to as GASC. Thank you for joining us today as we celebrate the third anniversary of this unique partnership. This Listen and Learn features our wonderful team of researchers and panelists who represent the City of Chicago, Cook County, and the State of Illinois. We will share the Alliance's collaborative efforts to prevent violence and bring peace to communities. To start this session, my friend and colleague, Lynetta Haynes-Turner, who is also a founding member of GASC, will provide insight in the foundation of how we formed. Thank you for your leadership and vision, Lynetta. I will pass it on to you. Thank you, and good morning, everyone. As Darby said, my name is Lynetta Haynes-Turner, and I'm the Chief of Staff to Cook County Board President Tony Preckwinkle and offices under the President. I am also a proud member of the Government Alliance for Safe Communities. With the full support and commitment of our leaders, Cook County Board President Tony Preckwinkle, City of Chicago Mayor Brandon Johnson, and Governor of the State of Illinois J.B. Pritzker, the Government Alliance is an unprecedented partnership and collaboration on our shared vision to strengthen the community safety ecosystem in the greater Chicago region. We started our collective work in 2021 to maximize the impact of the once in a lifetime federal COVID-19 American Rescue Plan funding or ARPA we received for the greater Chicago region. And we haven't slowed down since. We recognize that active coordination, collaboration, and communication are critical to effectively and sustainably increasing community safety. It is essential that we take a regional approach as the drivers and impacts of community violence extend beyond municipal lines. Early on, the Government Alliance successfully stewarded a historic level of investment of nearly $350 million in public ARPA funding for community safety within the city of Chicago, suburban Cook, and greater Illinois. In addition to those critical ARPA investments, we've spent a significant amount of time working together to coordinate and streamline our grant making processes, align on data collection and evaluation, and increase access to capacity building resources for community-based organizations working on the ground to build safer communities. This August marks our three year anniversary of that work together, and I would like to lift up some of our collective accomplishments. Recognizing the critical role of our 300 plus community based organizations who partner with us to deliver frontline CVI services, we established a community of practice to support them and learn from each other. Special thank you to all of those leaders who fellowship with us on a quarterly basis to share information, resources, and data across our collective work. In partnership with the Scaling CVI for Safer Chicago, or SC2, a coalition comprised of business, philanthropic, and community leaders, our three principals have pledged their commitment to continue sustainable CVI funding beyond ARPA which expires in 2026. And we are working closely with SC2 to ensure long-term impact for those CVI investments. In July, we launched a new website and capacity building resource library to create a centralized hub for information on our work, funding opportunities, and free capacity building resources, which is made available to any organization that needs it. Please visit ILGov govalliance.org. We just finalized a data sharing agreement, which is the first time in recent history that all three levels of government are leveraging shared data and analysis as part of the broader plan to transform the CVI ecosystem and increase community safety. And we are in the final stages of our work to develop and launch a shared model for capacity building service delivery to ensure that organizations delivering CVI street outreach programs are receiving comprehensive, consistent, and tailored programmatic and organizational capacity building support. While we're part of proud of the work we have done, 
we know that there is much more work to be done. And as they say on the streets, we stay ready. Before I turn it back to our moderator, on behalf of the Government Alliance, I wanna thank our many partners in the fight with us, including the experienced and dedicated community-based partner organizations on the ground doing the critical work of intervening and disrupting violence each and every day. The Civic Consulting Alliance and the Boston Consulting Group who are providing pro bono technical assistance support for which we could not do on our own. The SC2 Coalition who stand with us on our commitment to mitigate gun violence and has just raised $100 million towards that goal. And the Center for Neighborhood Engaged Research and Science or CORNERS who serve as our evaluation partners from Northwestern. We also could not do our work without the funding support and championship of our respective legislative bodies. So thank you to the members of the Illinois General Assembly, the Cook County Board of Commissioners and the Chicago City Council. Last but not least to the members of the Government Alliance and those colleagues who support our collective work, thank you Happy three year anniversary. And I continue to be humbled by your commitment, your leadership and the camaraderie we have built together. Without further ado, I'd like to turn it back to Director Adams. Thank you very much, Lynetta. And, and I have to say, you could see in Lynetta's remarks that this is truly an innovation, something very special that's happening in Illinois where we call it one table. And it's not just government, which will highlight today our unique collective work, but we also have philanthropy, business, community-based organizations, and all the very necessary partners that are needed in the ecosystem to drive change. So thank you again, Lynetta. Now we will turn it over to Whitney Key Towie, who is Cook County Justice Advisory Council's Director of Data Research and Co-Chair of the GAC Performance Management Workgroup. Whitney will provide a presentation on the importance of data cohesion in funding management. Whitney. Thank you, Director Adams. Hello, everybody. My name is Dr. Whitney Tahitawi. Um, I am not only the data, data Director of Data and Research at Cook County Justice Advisory Council, but I'm also the co-chair of the Performance Management Workgroup. And we are excited to talk to you about today about our steps towards uh, data cohesion and standardization through the GASC. Um, gun violence is a public health issue and occurs in public places, our streets, our parks, front porches, and impacts the entire community. The trauma of community violence extends beyond those directly injured by a shooting to those in the community who are exposed as a witness, a neighbor, a classmate, or an acquaintance. When individuals feel isolated, um, they are afraid to leave their homes and interact with their neighbors and participate in community functions, the health of the overall community is adversely impacted. Community violence is concentrated in poor, segregated, and disinvested neighborhoods with a few economic opportunities. These neighborhoods have suffered from a legacy of racist and discriminatory public policies that create conditions for violence. Consequently, Black Americans are disproportionately impacted by gun violence, and a small number of those people within these disinvested neighborhoods drive the most violence. They're often caught in cycles of victimization, trauma, retaliation, and disconnected from work, school, and the lack of community sports to help them heal. For generations, policing and incarceration have been the primary means for gun violence in underserved areas, and these systems have been ineffective and perpetuated or exacerbated racial inequities. Community violence intervention programs are designed to reduce gun violence in the most impacted neighborhoods through outreach by credible messengers who work with individuals involved in gun violence. These programs are most effective when cities and states invest in comprehensive intervention and prevention efforts that engage a wide range of stakeholders and community leaders. CVI identifies those who are at the highest risk for violence and leverage community support to change behaviors and interrupt, and interrupt cycles of violence. CVI models are data-driven and informed by, um, informed by affected communities. There have been um, several, or through a combination of street outreach by credible messengers and behavioral, behavioral science-informed interventions, community violence intervention programs help de-escalate stressful situations before they lead to violence. 
There have been several peer-reviewed studies that have taken place in the last year that specifically looked at Chicago-based organizations and showed that demonstrated the efficacy, efficacy of, this, of these programs. Um, a Chicago Pride study by Corner showed a 73% reduction in violent crime arrests. University of Chicago Tri Crime Lab study uh, indicated becoming a man program can reduce violent crime 50, uh, arrests by 50%. And Chicago Crime Lab study denoted that Ready Chicago's program reduced strep, or reduced address by 79% and victimizations for shootings and homicides by 43%. For the performance management work group, we've taken strides in really trying to work together on identifying um, and how we operationalize certain definitions. So in 2021, when the organization started coming around, we started uh, identify what our common definition of CVI is and really how we start defining it. We then started identifying shared metrics that each uh, government agency needs to collect for reporting for ARPA and federal programs, but then also what are we interested in and what would you like to see across the board? Um, we started agreeing upon shared definitions of these metrics uh, across the board and really coming up with a standard definition. So we're all speaking the same language. And so community violence for the state is not different to the one with the city nor the county. We then created an instrument that grantees can implement to collect data. Uh, we implemented that in September 23, and we revised that based on community, and, uh, community feedback in July 24. And we're in the process of revising that instrument once again to really reflect um, a, an easy effort for our grantees to report the information, and then how are we able to synthesize that information on the back end. Uh, we then used the aggregate data at the agency level. So um, all agencies under uh, the county, for example, we take all that information and report it to the GASC, and then we also report that as a whole to the GASC. Um, we do that on an ongoing basis, but we do have quarterly report outs through our community of practice meetings that happen um, uh, once a quarter, both virtually and in person. So we can share and be transparent with the data that we are collecting. Um, and as uh, Ms. Lahane's Turner said earlier, uh, we've also drafted and executed a data use agreement that outlines our data storage and use um, this past July, which was quite historic. So why is this important? So it's really important to have a, uh, standardizing our metrics allows us to have government agencies be able to speak the same language, that we're all talking the same talk. Uh, it's really important to have a cohesive understanding and voice to communicate our successes and shortfalls um, to our stakeholders at large, as well as our community members. Um, streamlining our resources and really not on, uh, duplicating our efforts in the field help uh, understand our investments as well as we're not um, being wasteful in any sort of way. And then we also, it provides insight to inform the evolving work and the scaling of the CVI ecosystem. The GASC Performance Management Group was very cognizant of uh, creating an instrument that would be implemented across agencies regardless of their data capacity needs, so our data collection um, barriers. So we, we, all, uh, we created an Excel format that all agencies are able to uh, collect and report out. These are then sent to uh, their respective funding agency. And then um, each agency is able to aggregate the data and then report it out on the GASC level. So for example, um, since this data has been collected, um, I'm only reporting on our 2.0 instrument tool, which was implemented in July 23. Um, and this data has been collected from July 24. This represents about 70 CVI street outreach organizations. Um, over 20,000 individuals have been served, which is quite significant. And those are people who are continuing um, on an ongoing basis of services being, that are being provided. Um, in terms of new individuals, uh, for that last quarter that was been reported, um, almost 9,000 individuals. So you can see we're really making strides within the community. In terms of services that are provided through the um, GSC level, a lot of it's through street outreach, but we're also providing case management service and victim services, and then um, individuals who've been referred through by victim advocacy services as well. So you can see there's been a real impact here. Uh, we are not working in isolation. We are very fortunate to be blessed with a fantastic team that is around us. Uh, we work with corners from Northwestern University, Boston Consulting Group, and Civic Consulting Alliance. 
Um, they've been really instrumental in helping us understand our collective funding investment, uh, funding efforts across the uh, community um, in terms of understanding how much money we're investing in one area and are we seeing those residual impacts uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout that uh, area as well. And um, don't take our word for it. It's really meaningful to our community agencies as well. Uh, we're blessed to have Build as one of our grantees. And um, they were fortunate to share a quote that says, GASC has shown us that even when faced with a huge complex issue like gun violence, when different government agencies pull together, we have so much more power to fight it. These game-changing grants that help, help us do it all, hire more anti-violence mentors, open summer camps, and host joyful community festivals. Thank you for understanding that peace doesn't just happen, you have to build it. So thank you, Build. So thank you so much, Whitney. Um, really appreciate you giving us a context for data-driven decision-making. Very important um, in ensuring resource equity across all of our program areas. Um, so now we, we actually have a, a very fun part of our Listen and Learn today where we have a panel, a very special panel for you who will share the insights on how the GASC combines data and performance measurement with capacity building and effective resource allocation to support organizations working to bring peace and safety to our communities. We are gonna introduce our panel. I'm gonna start with Webster Vital, who is ICJA's Institute to Innovate Program Director and we also have Wandalyn Johnson, who's the Grants Management Director for Cook County Justice Advisory Council, and she is also a GASC Grants Management Workgroup Co-Chair. Marlita White, who is the Director of the Chicago Department of Public Health, Office of Violence Prevention, and Co-Chair of the GASC's Performance Management Subcommittee. Lastly, we have Joshua Coakley, who is not a part of the GAC, but a very instrumental part of our ecosystem. Um, he sits on the GAC's Community of Practice Advisory Committee Chair, where we have various community-based organizations as a part of that. And he is the Executive Director of Target Area Development Incorporated. So give a warm welcome to our panel and um, we will just dive right in. So if I could ask the first question um, to Webster. Webster, if you could talk a little bit about how capacity building is key to actually building equity across community organizations in Illinois that are working to address community and violence. Tell us about eye to eye and the role it plays in supporting community organizations. Thank you, Director. Um, so the Institute to Innovate, commonly known as I2I at the Illinois Criminal Justice Authority, um, is really designed to provide capacity building and technical assistance um, to localized grassroots organizations. Our mission is simple. Um, we really want to empower statewide community-based organizations by really providing tailored support um, to strengthen infrastructure, increase sustainability, um, and really address those critical capacity needs, especially for those community violence, um, those addressing community violence and other critical social issues. So really at its core, I2I um, is about empowerment. We, we know that community violence is a complex issue, really requiring a multifaceted response. Um, community organizations are often on the front lines, really directly engaging with those affected. So However, many of these organizations, especially those um, in those underserved areas, really face challenges that hinder their ability to provide um, effective um, support or interventions because of limited resources, um, gap in training, other difficulties, and really being able to um, sustain their efforts over time. And this is really where I to I step in because our primary mission is really capacity building. Um, we focus on building upon existing assets of organizations, but also enhancing um, their skills, their knowledge, uh, also their infrastructures of the organization so that they can operate more efficiently, but also more effectively in their work. Um, so through our targeted training workshops, our ongoing technical support, um, as well as our one-on-one -on -one coaching, um, Eye to Eye really helps these groups by providing a solid foundation 
Um, this isn't just about offering a temporary boost, but really about creating a long-term sustainability so that these organizations can continue um, their work, but all, especially when those external support starts to diminish. And more importantly, Eye to Eye is really um, deeply committed to equity. We recognize that communities most affected by violence are often um, those that have least access to resources. So Eye to Eye really try to prioritize um, support for these organizations by working in these marginalized areas, really ensuring that they receive the necessary tools and guidance to really make the impact that they're working on within their communities. And so we do this by leveling the playing field, allowing organizations to compete for funding, um, form strategic partnerships, really help to advocate um, effectively for their communities. And another key piece I'll add is that eye to eye's approach is really about collaboration, even in our um, cohort model, we really understand that no single organization can really address um, community violence alone. So we really try to foster a network of community organization, um, government agencies or the member of GASC, but also other stakeholders creating this collaborative ecosystem where knowledge is shared, um, resources are pulled and efforts are really coordinated. So this is really our collective approach to really help to amplify the impact of individual grassroots organizations and really help to drive a more comprehensive and cohesive solution to these challenges. Great. Thank you so much for that, Webster. And, and what you described was what uh, maybe the state of Illinois through IC just doing, but GASC has embraced eye to eye as a collective strategy as we look at capacity building as one of our central priority areas for our collective work. So I did see there's a link in the chat um, that please feel free to um, to peruse that website and get more information. Um, well, you brought up, um, Webster, some key points about capacity building. One of the things that um, Lynetta shared in her opening remarks was that the GASC is, is really looking at how do we tell a collective impact story around our violence prevention funding? And we, we talked about the unprecedented dollars of ARPA. So I'm gonna to turn to Marlita. And if you could describe the GASC's efforts to measure the impact and reach of grant funding, what successes have you identified based on data reported to date? Uh, thank you, Director. Uh, one thing I think you've all heard already, or first let me say good, good morning to everyone. Uh, you've heard already from uh, Whitney the work that we've uh, done to create a shared data collection environment. And so I would say that uh, that would be the, the tool that I'd put forth um, as the primary uh, vehicle for this kind of collective uh, storytelling. Uh, we definitely recognize that data exist in various forms and there are many challenges trying to uh, understand and prioritize which data points are the most meaningful. And that is something I think that the performance management team and the, um, the GASC together has been able to really um, wrestle down which are those primary data points that we are going to prioritize in this data collection environment. I would say that because we are various um, funders, we still do have other uh, interests and other data points that we are still trying to reconcile and figure out how to lessen the load on the individual um, grantee. Um, but nevertheless, we have what we call our um, community violence uh, intervention or CVI metrics tool. We are on our 2.0 version. And that tool is what we have all of our grantees um, uh, utilizing. And then quarterly, we do a data share and all of that data then comes into our, uh, through one of our partners within the GASC. And then we are going through the process of cleaning the data and then also sharing that data out to our partners in our quarterly convenings that you all have heard about already but also this is additional data that the partners are looking at and using that to make really, uh, I think, strategic decisions, especially around where capacity building is needed, but also helping us understand collectively who's being reached, who may be being underserved. Um, what do we learn differently and better about the kinds of interventions that are being called upon, mediations and other kinds of um, 
uh, hands-on interventions that the providers are initiating in the communities. Uh, we're learning about how to right-size our expectations as funders, which is always, I'm sure, um, the grantees um, would appreciate that, but also how to speak in single and unified terms of, in terms of what we're looking for and what is available, what's being provided, and what those barriers are. Um, I would also say one particular success that I would raise is that we have been able to, through this activity of trying to develop the tool, we've had these rich conversations with partners, for example, through the advisory committee and even in our community of practice, where the partners have voice and they're saying, this is really difficult, we can't address this particular data point. And then it, there's that negotiation process, really trying to understand um, what is reasonable and appropriate to ask and how you ensure that the data points we're trying to um, uh, understand are actually in alignment with what the, in the ways that the practice happens. Thank you for that, Marlita. Just key points to lift up. Many of you are on this listen and learn to hear of how we collaborate, but I hope you're hearing that government's getting smarter, that we're learning how to work better with you as community organizations. And, and what Marlita shared is a testament to that. So I'm going to pivot to Wandalyn um, now for her to talk about how the GASC is examining the grant making process, right? How do we ensure effective, equitable, and sustainable grant administration, specifically for CVI organizations across Illinois? What has been happening? Like what gaps are you seeing and what improvements have been made? Okay. Well, thank you, Director Adams. Well, immediately in 2022, uh, GAS, and at that time we were the Intergovernmental Partnership, IGP, uh, work to um, streamline uh, our offer notice of funding opportunities that was uh, coming out then at that time. Uh, first, we work to define key service categories and definitions. Uh, we also work to coordinate the release of our funding opportunities for uh, each agency uh, to make sure that we are streamlined and we were working collaboratively with our notice of funding opportunities. Uh, we looked to ensure that the timelines were aligned and also sought, sought to streamline the information that was being requested in our notice of funding opportunities. Uh, and going forward, what has been taking place since 2022 and, and beyond, uh, we continue to work to coordinate and streamline the grant making process. Uh, we established the grants management work group, which was established in 2022. Uh, one of the key priorities of the grants management work group is to look to improve the administration of public grant funding. Uh, we look to assess and enhance grant processes by gaining a better understanding of what each uh, agency is, is doing and how we can align our information and share information and resources. And finally, as Marlita had mentioned, uh, we as, with the establishment of the performance management work group, both performance management and grants management work group work to collaboratively uh, streamline data submission processes and, and via the development and dissemination of the CBI 1.02 and now the 2.02 tool. Thank you, Wandalyn. Lots of great work happening in the GAC GASC around performance measurement data. Um, it is a data-driven uh, process that we try to take, um, but we would be nothing without the voices of our community of practice and getting that insight as both Marlita and Wa Wandalyn raised up to help inform our work, to help really build um, the tools and the strategies that, that we as government think is important. We, we definitely have to make sure that we're meeting organizations where they are. And so that's why I'm so honored that Joshua has joined us today and can really speak um, from that lens and share, perhaps Joshua, could you answer um, what is the community of practice and why is it beneficial to agencies providing community violence intervention services? Absolutely, thank you, Director Adams for the opportunity 
So let's start with the first question. The the community of practice was a group of people coming together, you know, to share concerns and their passionate about something they want to learn how to do or know how to do or better interact regularly, right? Uh, I often say this, being an organization that will be turning 30 years old, um, who who were one of the founding uh, organizations with ceasefire, better known as Cure Violence Now, uh, really doing the groundwork when this work wasn't even really notarized on the level that it's being recognized on now. Uh, so really being in that space to keep that uniform practice, right, that foundation that built the work, right, uh, being able to share those best practices. So when we're looking at violence, we have a uniform practice. Uh, the second question I would say, how does it benefit our, uh, the, the, the violence prevention services? Um, I often say this all the time, Director. All I know is what I know. If I learn what you guys know, I know more, right? So being able to look at those different cultures, right, of how outreach may look in Little Village, how outreach may look in the back of the yards, how outreach may look at Auburn Gresham or Inglewood, it really shares best practice, but then also establish that opportunity to challenge some practices that may not work, you know, or being able to be informative to you guys about what we should be measuring, uh, the safety of our participants, et cetera, right? Like all of these things that uh, we come up with to share best practices, because it's important for us to continue to have the trust in the community. And we don't want them to believe that we're just using them as data points, even though we know data matters. But I, it's definitely a, a shared community where we could definitely learn from each other, enlighten each other, but also come up with best practices. Because I think a lot of people have a different language about what violence prevention is, right? Just one quick example. A lot of times people say high risk, they mix high risk up with at risk. And there's a total difference, right? Because we use practices to identify that population so they won't be underserved when it comes to these services. So really being intentional about educating this community of practice, but also getting feedback so we all can have best practices when it comes to government, state, and community-based organizations. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Joshua, for that answer. And if you were a fly on the wall We've had many meetings as a GSC. I know we were presenting in front of you today as this cohesive group. We've had some knockdown conversations, right? And one of our very first was definitions. How do each of our entities define high risk and at risk? And, and we all did it a little differently. So one of our first acts together was to agree on what the definition of high risk was. And I do believe the community of practice helped break a few ties and lean us all in the right direction. So, so really appreciate you raising that. I'm gonna move back to Webster. Um, Webster, we, we constantly have this thread of capacity building running through, um, kind of what Joshua raised up in, in talking about the importance of the community of practice is he talked about best practices and, and how we create sustainability in organizations and, and that goes right back to capacity building. Um, so can you talk about a little bit about why is organizational capacity building important and why government has a role in that? Yeah, thank you for that question, Director. Um, let me start by emphasizing that, you know, capacity building is not just a buzzword. Um, it's it's a, life, um, a lifeline for these organizations. So when you think about CBI organizations and um, they're often doing incredible work under incredible challenge, you know, challenging situations or conditions. They're the ones on the front line. They're, um, you know, they're addressing community violence in real time. Um, they're the ones that are often operating with limited resources, facing staff burnout, um, really trying to stretch every dollar as far as it can go. Um, so capacity building is very important because it provides these organizations um, really with the tools, strategies, um, and support they really need to sustain their operations for the long haul. So really ensuring that they're not just here today, but also how do we ensure that they're, you know, making the difference um, down for years to come. So when I think about capacity building, I think about it as a way to really enhance the impact of these organizations. It's not just about, uh, it's not just enough to just survive, but also how do we ensure these organizations are thriving? 
Um, so really, we by uh, really strengthening their internal structures, improving those uh, management practices, um, I think really investing in their staff development and really helping them to de de deliver services more effectively is really where um, capacity building come into play to really help reach more people, but also provide higher quality um, interventions as in, in a way to sort of really adapt to um, new challenges. As we do know, capacity building helps supports really with um, innovation and growth, especially with the nature of community violence is constantly changing. Um, and these organizations really need to be able to um, innovate to um, keep up with just the, the different changes that are coming. So through capacity building, they have the, they gain those skills, but also those resources to really implement those evidence-based practices, adapt new technology or methodologies um, to really address some of these problems. And I'll, I'll end with um, capacity building really being that crucial driver um, for equity and empowerment because many CBI organizations really work within the communities that have been marginalized and underserved for far too long. So we do know that by strengthening these organizations, um, we really help ensure that the people that are most affected by violence have the tools um, to really advocate for themselves, secure the resources they need, but also participate fully in the decisions that really impact um, their lives. So it's all about really shifting the power um, back to the communities um, and really giving the agencies um, leads the, the ability to really um, take the change into their own hands. So I think I would say capacity building is absolutely essential for this group, um, just to ensure sustainability, um, really leveling up impact and really driving innovation and promote equity. Um, so if we're really serious about um, changing um, circumstances around violence, we really need to be serious about building up these organizations um, that are doing this work every day. Yes, Thank absolutely. You. I love that comment about sustainability because what, what we know about our own communities is that when service provisions are available and when they, to your point, um, Joshua, are trusted organizations that have longevity and history and families know and trust them, you have healthier communities, right? Um, so Marlita, we, we, we love talking about data. It's probably people in here that, you know, when we get to the data questions, they they turn their um, sound down a little bit, right? Because it's complicated and reporting, it triggers people and makes them unhappy. <laughs> but we like to think about how do we utilize um, our data? How do we tell our own story? So one of the key priorities of the performance subcommittee that you co-chair is to ensure that grantees have the data training and resources that they need to successfully manage, monitor, and report on their publicly funded grant programs. Tell us about the data GASC plans to make available and how it will be provided to organizations. Uh, sure. So I will say that I agree that uh, some people definitely um, for some people, data collection is the grown zone. Um, but what we've been able to do across the various community of practice convenience, for example, is to center data in a way that it's not so much um, the data is collected from the partners and then the funders run off and no one ever hears about it. But every community of practice, we have an opportunity to report back to the collective of all of the data that we've been able to gather across their service services and put that back in front of them. And then we have discussions with the partners that have to do with kind of creative approaches. So how do we use the data to tell our story differently? What is the narrative um, that we are countering if it's um, people don't understand what CVI is? Um, grant, uh, maybe decision makers don't understand what those services look like. Uh, maybe even our family members, some of the CVI partners uh, talk about how their families don't always understand exactly what they do. So we talked about how to use data to support ourselves in terms of um, elevating self-care opportunities, but certainly to be able to report to the community at large and the grantors and the other decision makers what exactly is happening in the communities and as a result of these investments. And so when we onboarded the 1.0 tool and certainly with the 2.0, we're using the available technology. So definitely one-to-one, -one, the grants team, the grant makers are meeting with their grant grantees about the tool and unpacking it, making sure everyone, all of our users 
know how to complete the tool. Um, we've created webinars so that, again, we're trying to make that training more portable and accessible to partners on demand. Um, and then we've also kept an open ear. And so um, when we're having these convenings, when we're talking to advisory um, members and even post community practice, we want to understand where are the pain points and data collection. Um, and so all of these opportunities we're employing um, not dropping anything off, but keeping all of those avenues open moving forward as we continue to refine and collect data. The idea in terms of future use is that we are at least quarterly likely to be putting that data uh, through um, um, of it, making that data available to the public using the GAS website that you all have mentioned already. We also will continue to do the kind of data discussions and roundabouts in our community of practice with our partners and the grant grantees to make sure that we are maximizing the data that we're gathering and learning from it, encouraging continuous quality improvement at the homes of our various community partners, but also how GAS itself continues to learn from the data we're collecting. Thank you so much for that, Marlita. Wandalyn, if you could piggyback on that, how has the GASC engaged with funded CVI organizations to better understand the successes, challenges, and lessons learned in the field in general? Absolutely. Well, previously, as many have mentioned here, our community of practice uh, certainly uh, takes up the banner uh, for that um, the CVI Community of Practice was established in 2022 with its first convening held in September of 2022. Since then, the CVI Community of Practice continues to be a great resource for CVI-funded agencies to share experiences, successes, and challenges in the field. Uh, GAS Partners, we work alongside the CVI Community uh, Advisory Committee, which is representative of the community and uh, CVI organizations, uh, and they help to develop content for the CVI uh, community of practice convenings. Uh, since the establishment of the community of practice, we've held five CVI convenings, three in person, two virtually, uh, with the most recent convening on July 17th. Uh, learning opportunity topics in include, but it's not limited to uh, scaling for uh, CVI for Safer Chicago, uh, the CVI ecosystem, best practices in prevention and intervention, mastering self-care, recruitment and retention for street outreach and building a successful workforce for street, outfe street outreach, uh, violence prevention community support teams, we, we've discussed that. So the community of practice continues to work to identify strategies to further engage CBI organizations and enhance learning opportunities. Yes, absolutely. Joshua, how have community-based agencies benefited from the government entities funding for CBI, creating an alliance to collect the same data across all agencies? Thank you for the question, Director Adams. Uh, first of all, let me start with saying this. Thank you guys for making history, right? Uh, because this never happened. Uh, and we want to acknowledge history when it's being made, right? Because we all understand that a, a shared practice is a successful practice. I would say standardizing data collection practice across all agencies has an en enhanced our collaboration, enabling agencies to share insight and best practices leading to more effective virus prevention strategies. The standardized data collection efforts also provide clear evidence of impact, strength, and funding opportunities that allow us to better evaluate our programs and advocate for more policy change. Uh, and, and, and also what I also learned, right, uh, it, like somebody mentioned, I, I think, you know, just being able to do this work so long, we understand 
that data also speaks for the community. Uh, I'll never forget when we first began surveying the community back in 1995, because we wanted to hear what they wanted and what, what they needed, right? And surveying that community and bringing back that data, we realized that violence was more of an issue than uh, redevelopment, which we were redeveloping 79th Street at that time. So um, data drives so many things and it answers so many question, questions. And in a world where we in, when we're training and professionalizing the standards of outreach, we say if it ain't written down, it didn't happen. So we understand that you guys need data to tell a story, but also we know data also pushes the narrative for us to get more opportunities in our community. I'm gonna just give you a quick data point. Uh, the reason why I believe that they begin to continue funding FLIP, which stands for Flatline and Violence Inspiring Peace, was due to the corners data points and telling the story how we seen a 60 and 90% reduction in those hotspot areas. So data do prove your point, right? Because I often say this all the time, people may lie, but data don't. So uh, I'll end at that note. <laughs> Thank you, Joshua. And, and, and here's what we'd like to invite in. In a, a true partnership and what we're learning as government is there is no bad data. Even when the outcomes maybe tell us a different story, it gives us an opportunity to dig in. Or guess what? Maybe we listen to your justification of what you're seeing on the ground, what trends maybe haven't caught up with us as the funders that you see day to day. So I'm just encouraging everybody to be honest and transparent in their reporting because even the things that we, we maybe don't get to the mark that we're trying to get is telling us what needs to happen or how we need to pivot or do better or just start to have the conversation. Um, so I am going to kind of land there with this amazing panel and give everybody one last thought. If our audience is very broad, it's, it's service providers, it's government agencies, it's people from different parts of the country who want to do something similar to a collective collaborative approach. So if you had one takeaway, um, you know, kind of based on our capacity building and all that we've discussed, um, you have one minute to give people that those golden nuggets. And I'll start with Wanda Lynn. Thank you, Director Adams. Well, we have to think broadly about the ecosystem in which CBI providers operate and ensure our coordinated grant making strategies, also strategically fostering support for other complementary models of care operating in neighborhoods with significant CBI investments already in place. For example, positive youth services, services supporting women and girls and services that concentrate on mental health crisis and support for survivors and victims of gun violence inherently overlap with CBI services. GASC entities are always keeping this in mind as we steward limited resources and foster strong collaboration amongst partners and communities most impacted by gun violence. We also want to keep making progress on bringing down the barriers to participation in government grant opportunities, including more universal grant applications that can be accepted by each GASC entity and conforms with unique procurement barriers posed at each government level. Thank you. You're on mute, Director Adams. Oh, I said I wasn't going to get caught up on mute. <laughs> Webster, final thoughts? Thanks, Director. Um, yeah, I'll add, you know, we all know that the work of addressing community violence is incredibly challenging, um, and it requires so much from every person and organization um, really involved. So I, I'd say, like, be, but if, you know, some of the, because of some of the important work that they all do and we all do, um, when we talk about capacity building, we're talking about more than just resources or trainings. Um, we're really talking about giving people and communities um, the strength and support um, they need to really create those lasting changes. So as Director Adams, you so power, um, um, powerfully put it once, um, our commitment to public safety starts with an ongoing investment in you, really ensuring lasting impact. This is really about investing in the people in this room, 
um, the organizations on the ground, the communities we so care about. Um, and it's really about believing that when we build each other up and really build a safer, more equitable future for all, um, you know, we we're, we're really want to keep the commitment strong and remember that every step we take in supporting each other is really bringing us closer um, to building safer communities throughout our state. So I'll end with that. I love that. Marlita, final thoughts? One minute. So I would say um, what I have benefited the most from uh, through the gas experience is having capacity building happen alongside with growing performance management, alongside with growing grants management, alongside with um, working through an external um, um, evaluation partner corners. So that we're really trying to cover the waterfront of understanding the funding environment, the grantee experience, and all of those kind of important elements that go toward the story of impact. Um, I would encourage our partners and we do it every convening and ongoing data collection and just in terms of performance management is more than just giving the grantor what they want. Um, but looking at that data, that data is your data and you should use that to improve your own performance and your own practice if no one ever asked for it. Um, but I enjoy the process of us really hashing that out and talking it through and being able to say, hey, I'm not collecting the right information and I need help to do that. So I hope that other partners uh, create that that space where people can ask questions. Thank you so much. And last but not least, Joshua, if you could give your final thoughts. Thank you, Director Adams. So really quick, as she said, one minute. You know you can't get no preaching no one minute, but <laughs> now um, let's, let's continue, man, to uh, learn, build these learning communities and creating this uniform of practice, you know, across the city, across the state that Chicago could continue to be the model for violence prevention. Uh, I'll never forget, we made history. We we had people graduating from the White House. Uh, violence prevention been notarized on a, a, a national level. So uh, it's amazing what I'm seeing, the fruit of the labor. Uh, I'll never forget beginning sowing seed about 18 years ago in this work when it was recognized more so as a hug a thug program. No one truly believed that we can uproot our own uh, issues. And I tell them all the time, it's going to take us to save us. Those who do the work should lead the work. And I truly believe that if we awaken the spirit of leadership in our communities and empower people that's actually harmed by these root causes, they will be the change that we need. So uh, I'm just super excited about our future. And let's continue to interrupt this, this disease called violence. Because we got the cure, y'all. We just got to spread it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joshua. I, I was nervous about going after you, but since my job is just to close us out, I think I'm in a safe space. So thank again our panelists and give them a round of applause. Amazing job and great information. I also want to thank Lynetta Haynes-Turner, Chief of Staff for Cook County Board President Tony Preckwinkle, and Whitney Key Towie, who is the Director at the Justice Advisory Council for her presentation and for sharing your insights with us today. As we know, your time is valuable. I hope you found the session enlightening and inspiring and that you got nuggets today that you can take away with you, that you know how to access more research, more resources as a result of this listen and learn. But to learn more, please visit the GASC website at www.ilgovalliance.org. You will also receive a survey. Feedback is our gift. So please share your thoughts. It will impact what we do in the future and what events we offer. I did see a lot in the comments about the need to learn more about capacity building. And, and we definitely have a lot of thoughts on that and some great work that's coming down the pipeline. And so that could very well be, be our next gathering together. So without further ado, I will give you back time to your afternoon. We all sincerely thank you for joining us today and learning about the incredible collaboration work that is happening across the state of Illinois. Have a great afternoon, everyone.